The 1950s and 60s were the golden age of space. Mankind went from Sputnik 1 to Apollo 11 in just 12 years. You would imagine that Armstrong's first step would be the catalyst for further manned missions across the solar system and beyond. Yet over 50 years later, mankind remained stubbornly clung to the Earth. Even now in 2021, the logical next step, a manned mission to Mars, still realistically seemed decades away. So, the question must be asked, what has the space industry been up to since 1969? Well, thankfully because no one asked, I thought I'd give the answer. We will take each calendar year from 1970 to 2020 and find one event for each year where something has been done for the first time or a notable event has occurred. Each year's explanation will be relatively brief as I want this video out before the heat death of the universe. Also, if I miss something notable in a year, please let me know. With that, let's get started. Let's begin with Venus. Venus is hot, like really hot, yet the Soviet Union decided this would be the site of the first probe to land on another planet. The Venera 7 probe approached Venus ready for landing on the 15th of December 1970. During its descent, Venera's parachute ripped, leading to a 29 minute free fall. Yet this is still classed as the first soft landing on another planet. Despite its conditions and how it had landed at terminal velocity, the probe amazingly still worked. Later analysis showed the probe pushed on for 23 minutes. The data showed that the surface temperature was around 470 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric pressures were over 75 times that found on Earth. However, more important than any data collected was that the Soviet Union beat the Americans to Venus, giving them another point in the space race. Satisfied with their 23 minute Venusian excursion, the Soviets had some spare cash. They used the cash to beat the Americans in the space race. Again, this time the Soviets launched the first space station into low Earth orbit. The Salyut 1 was launched on April 19, 1971, however the project did not quite go to plan. Three attempts were made for crews to board the station. The only successful docking was with the Soyuz 11 crew. After being aboard Salyut for 23 days, the Soyuz crew were tragically killed during re-entry. This sparked the end for the Salyut mission and later in 1971, Salyut 1 was terminated and allowed to burn up during re-entry. Just over 12 months after Apollo 11, the excitement of Man on the Moon had faded. Budget cuts led to Apollo 18, 19 and 20 being cancelled. Therefore, 1972's Apollo 17 becomes, at the time of writing, the last manned mission to the moon. The astronauts on the surface made the most of their lunar play date, however, extracting more lunar material and spending longer on the surface and in lunar orbit than any mission had done before. In 1973, the Pioneer 10 Pro became not only the first to traverse the asteroid belt, but then went on to perform the first flyby of Jupiter. Pioneer was, well, a pioneer. Attached to the Pro was the Pioneer Golden Plaque, showing information about humanity as well as where the probe came from. The plaque would act as a message to whoever found it, informing them of the existence of humanity. Speaking of messages from Earth... In 1974, Earth sent out an intergalactic DM. Using the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, scientists broadcasted a string of binary code known as the Arecibo message. The code, aimed at the M13 system, contains the numbers 1 to 10, the components of DNA, what humans kind of look like with a height of 176 centimeters, the solar system with Earth rays, and a rough diagram of the telescope itself. However, given that M13 is 21,000 light years away, I would move on and find someone else rather than hang around. The Cold War became a bit more lukewarm in 1975 with the cooperation of the Soviets and the United States in a space test. The Apollo Soyuz test is seen as many as the end of the space race. Astronauts aboard an Apollo craft and cosmonauts aboard a Soyuz vehicle entered their counterparts modules for the first time. This will be one of the first instances of space cooperation between the superpowers, which is commonplace today with projects such as the ISS. Given that effectively none of the 110 meters of the Saturn V is reusable, NASA decided to find a more sustainable solution. This makes sense as when you get to your destination, you don't throw your car away. The answer was a different kind of spacecraft, one that could be used for multiple space flights. The prototype of a reusable spacecraft was shown publicly in 1976, the Space Shuttle. The shuttle, named after the Enterprise, flew five times but never to space as this was merely a prototype model. So remember the golden plaque from 1973? A number of scientists criticised it for being non-alien friendly. So just before Voyager 1 and 2 were launched, with Voyager 2 going on a tour of the gas giants, a new message was required. 
we decided to let the aliens do the work this time and created the Golden Record. The record is essentially NASA's mixtape with songs for the aliens to pop along to, like this. Go, Johnny, go, go. Johnny, be good. Images. As well as scientific measurements in the hope to find some common ground with our extraterrestrial neighbours. You may imagine that for the 1978 entry onto this list it would be the first non-American or Soviet citizen being sent in space. And yes indeed, in 1978, Czechoslovakian citizen Vladimir Remek launched above Soyuz 28. This is all good for foreign relations and all that, but more importantly for this year was the launch of the global smash hit arcade game Space Invaders. You may think based on history and what you've heard so far that there are only two main players in the space industry. The United States and Russia. Well now we introduce a third player into the ring. In 1975 the European Space Agency ESA, was formed. The ESA is a coalition consisting of 22 European countries, even you post Brexit UK. The agency had sought to build its own rocket, the Ariane. The ESA justified this by saying quote, the reason was simple, no launcher, no independent access to space, no space program, end quote. So they built one and by 1979 it was ready. They prepared for the launch on the 15th of December from their site in French Guiana. And the rockets failed. So they tried again on the 23rd. Bad weather. Ok, try again on Christmas Eve. Ok, this time it worked. From there the ESA went on to launch several missions, but more on them in part 2. It's Valentine's Day 1980. Let's say you and I go on a trip. We need somewhere, well, hot. How about the sun? This is what NASA thought of when they launched the Solar Maximum mission on the 14th of February 1980. Slight problem, the altitude sensor was broke on it. Ok, we'll repair it in 1984, but it still counts for 1980. The mission's aim was to measure the energy output and solar flare activity of the sun. In particular, how the brightness of the sun changes during the sunspot activity cycle. The findings were that the sun was actually brighter when a greater number of sunspots were present on the surface. After tinkering with the space shuttle design for 5 years, NASA was ready with the finished product. April the 12th, 20 years to the day after Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space, the first space shuttle mission was launched from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Given the mission code STS-1, the Space Shuttle Columbia carried only two crew members and was essentially a full test run of the spacecraft. The mission paved the way for a total of 135 space shuttle missions, but more on them later. On March 10th 1982, every planet was on the same side of the sun. The event known as Syzygy sounds like a biblical apocalyptic event, and naturally a few doomsday preppers were excited to eat from a can in a single room whilst waiting for the apocalypse to be over. However, after doing extensive research and realising current years after 1982, we can assume this did not occur. Ronald Reagan, a man whose most famous acting role was that of being US President, made an address to the nation in 1983. In the address he called on the scientific community to find a way to make nuclear weapons obsolete. Given the escalation of tensions between the US and the Soviet Union during his presidency, Reagan sought to give the US the edge. This led to the Strategic Defense Initiative, more commonly known as Star Wars. The system would use a series of satellites fitted with lasers aimed at destroying any potential hostile nuke attacks on the United States. If you're sat there thinking, that's a bit ambitious, you can figure out why it never came to fruition. Especially when people began to question if this would break the fragile peace agreement brought about through the Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD Doctrine. In what I can assume is a hold my beer moment, on board the Challenger Space Shuttle, astronauts Bruce McCandless and Robert Stewart took the new manned manoeuvring unit, MMU, for a test drive. The MMU was essentially a wireless spacesuit. This led to the pair becoming the first humans to undergo an untethered extravehicular activity, EVA, or if you prefer, an untethered spacewalk. This did not start a trend however, as most astronauts considered performing a spacewalk a big enough flex without being untethered. By the mid 80s, interest in space travel was falling. NASA wanted to captivate a new audience by sending civilian personnel into space. Originally NASA wanted to use Big Bird from Sesame Street, but an 8 foot tall bird in costume being sent into space wouldn't be particularly convenient. Instead NASA launched a Teacher in Space program. On the 19th of July 1985, the winner of the program was announced as Kristen McClough, a social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire. 
The plan ended in disaster, however, as Krusta, as well as the other six crew members on the Challenger Space Shuttle, died in an explosion just after takeoff. On the 8th of March 1986, Halley's Comet returned to Earth's vicinity. The comet, one of the few regularly visible with the human eye, passes Earth roughly every 75 years, which means that in the time it takes between passes, Nintendo will release three full directs. So keep fit kids because it's a long time until its next scheduled visit in 2061. Okay, so the next three years I don't really have much to say about them, so let's make this quick. Supernova 1987A was the brightest supernova in nearly 400 years. This was one of the first and best opportunities for astronomers to study both the before and after stages of a star's death. Over two and a half years after the Challenger explosion, the Space Shuttle program resumed with the STS-26 aboard the Discovery Space Shuttle. Andrew and our friend from 1977, Voyager 1, well he's finished his four planet one pro tour of the solar system by arriving at Neptune. Ok, back to normal pace. Imagine you spend around 8 years working on your astronomy doctorate. You wake up happy because you get to look at the stars and planets all night. You adjust your eyes accordingly and it's cloudy. Despite putting man on the moon, clouds thwart the earthbound astronomer. Then someone had an idea. Put the telescope above the clouds. In space itself. This idea led to the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990. Although not the first space telescope, it was one of the most powerful leading to stunning images of faraway star systems never seen on Earth. Since its installation in Earth's orbit in 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope has made 1.4 million observations and the data has been used in the publication of over 18,000 scientific papers. This makes the Hubble Space Telescope one of the most useful single scientific apparatus in human history. On its way to Jupiter, the Galileo probe made a quick detour to make history by becoming the first probe to fly by an asteroid. By getting within 1000 kilometers of 951 Gaspera, Galileo was able to take this photo before getting back on the cosmic highway for Jupiter. Speaking of Galileo... In 1992, the boss man of the Catholic Church at the time, John Paul II, confirmed that Galileo may have been onto something with his heliocentric solar system model. In 1633, Galileo had been forced, by threat of torture, to recant his theories of the Earth revolving around the Sun. 350 years later, however, Pope John Paul II confirmed the findings of the investigation into the Galileo affair. This aligned the Church's views of the solar system with that of the wider scientific community. We haven't checked up on the Soviet Union in a while, let's see how they're doing. Oh wait, they've collapsed. Despite this temporary inconvenience, the Russian space program moves forward. In 1993, in a somewhat villainous aura, the Russians launched Zanamya. Zanamya was effectively a large mirror in space. The idea was that this mirror could reflect the sunlight onto the nightcast areas, increasing the amount of daylight in the day, as well as extracting some solar energy. Now, because we're good friends here, I know what you're thinking. That is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. However, two points. One, the bloke who designed it worked on Yuri Gagarin's rocket. And two, it worked, in a way. Eyewitnesses claim the reflected light was, quote, equivalent to that of several full moons, end quote. However, given that since 1993, there have been at least one instance of nighttime, you have to say it never caught on. Aboard the STS-60, NASA launched the Wake Shield Facility Experiment. The contraption involves two metal discs being dragged in the thermosphere, TLDR very high up with very little air or gases. By dragging the plates behind the craft, a cone-shaped vortex emerged in the machine's wake, creating a vacuum. This in turn allowed NASA to, quote, grow a thin film of compounds such as gassium arsenide, end quote. I need a master's degree in particle physics to explain this in greater detail, but unfortunately my master's degree says economics. Well, my brain cells hurt now, so this will do us for this part. This video is nearly 15 minutes as is. The second part of this video should be released at the same time, focusing on 1995 to 2020. Thank you very much for watching, hopefully see you soon, take care.